Palival. Ankur Palival is a multi-award winning independent journalist. He writes mostly about science, inequity, and queer people. He is the founder and managing editor of Queer Beat, a collaborative, a collaborative journalism venture focused on accurately covering LGBTQIA plus communities in India. He is also a senior producer with CNN's As Equals project, where he edits a story series called Beyond the Binary which looks at what it means to live as a trans and non-binary person in the global south. In his 13 years of journalism career, Ankur has tried to shine light on the stories of underreported people and places. He has written about neglected crops and diseases, queer and indigenous communities, and caste and climate change from India, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, Ghana, and the US for various publications, including The Guardian, Nature, Scientific American, and 52. He has received multiple reporting fellowships from the Pulitzer Center, Doctors Without Borders, Thakur Foundation, and Nature Press Foundation. In 2021, he was a fellow at the Entrepreneurial Journalism Creators Program at the City University of New York. Ankur has a master's degree in science journalism from Columbia University in New York. And of course, what he has not mentioned in his biodata is that he's won a uh, uh, the AAAS Kavli Science Prize, which is a gold medal for the best uh, reporting in a certain category. So, uh, welcome to the uh, podium. Now I'm going to say that cliché thing that I'm standing between you and the lunch. <laughs> Maybe some of you eat your lunch early. I, I eat my lunch early. I'll try and make the presentation uh, interesting, exciting, so you don't fall asleep. Um, so, um, thank you, Shubha, for that lovely and kind introduction. We have already heard really fabulous and fascinating talks this uh, morning. Um, I am here to present a view from the margins and why that has been a driving force in the kind of science journalism that I have tried to do. Also, my one of the goals here today is to have us a really expansive view of science. Think of science beyond what scientists do in labs. I want us to think about, which some of the earlier speakers touched on, is who gets to be in the lab. Uh, and that is what uh, I'll be talking about today. But before I begin, I want to thank the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Kabli Foundation for supporting my appearance here today as part of the AAAS Kabli Science Journalism Award Lecture Series. I also want to thank ACJ for uh, uh, inviting me here today and for giving me this opportunity and stage to talk about something I'm really passionate about. The picture that you see on the slide over there is a picture that I took about three years ago uh, from a village in uh, Maharashtra. You see those, those handles on the wall? I'll come to those handles later. Just remember the slide. As I'm talking about the margins, OK. So uh, what I was talking about is that what's on the margins on uh, science. Uh, but uh, I'll go back um, a little. Historically, most of the science journalism across the world has focused on and continues to focus on big subjects tackled by big scientists affecting big number of people or catching the fancy of big number of people. Think moon landings, green revolution, AIDS epidemic, cancer, heart diseases, climate change, and recently, COVID-19. All of these subjects are really important to be covered as they are complex and keep evolving. But what tends to happen is that when newsrooms or journalists are talking about these subjects, they pay much less attention to and sometimes completely <coughs> overlook the marginalized communities who are also <coughs> affected by these uh, topics. Uh, what is their view on these topics? And I want to cover some of those topics today in my talk today. 
some are here. Rare and neglected diseases, something I've reported a lot about in my career. Orphan crops. Mathematics is one area I feel like should be covered more, isn't covered enough uh, in Indian journalism. Underrepresented communities like Dalit, indigenous, and LGBTQIA plus communities. Like I said in the beginning of my talk, I want us to think about who gets to do science in the labs. Scientific collaborations are increasing uh, across the world. What is the nature of those collaborations? Who gets to do what in those collaborations? Who gets to participate in science? <coughs> These are all the views from the margins. In other words, I'm talking about the underreported. The underreported is also the one who often gets misreported. <coughs> but why do I cover the underreported? When I started my career as a science journalist, I started with Down to Earth magazine. Some of you may have heard of the uh, magazine. It's run by Center for Science and Environment. It's a fascinating. Uh, ground for a journalist if you are starting out your career, really rigorous reporting, and I'm fortunate that I got to be a part of it. Uh, when I started covering uh, uh, science, I just found myself gravitating toward the marginalized communities, their questions, how they were affected by the big topics that the magazine was covering. But the, at that time, I didn't quite know why I was doing that. But in the last couple of years, uh, um, when I've tried to slow down in my journalism and asked myself why I was doing that, I found some clues, and which is where I would encourage all of you to uh, look into your own motivations about why do you want to do journalism, what kind of specific journalism you want to do, and where you can bring in your own experience to contribute to the journalism that you want to do. I grew up in a very small town in UP. I'm gay. I did not find myself represented in the stories that I was reading in the local newspaper, in the media. Uh, I felt invisible story in the stories that I was reading. So my effort has been, when I started my career, and I'm now far more intentional about, this, about it, is to make communities feel seen, because I did not feel seen earlier. So which is what I try to do now. And I'll talk about the underreported, what it means to be underreported, through some examples of the subjects that I've tried to cover and the communities that I've tried to cover. Off balance. This is the story that won the AAA Scavli Science Journalism Award in 2022. The story is about a rare genetic disease that is there across the world, uh, but affects a lot of people in India too. When I started, uh, researching the disease, I actually found really no mention of it in the uh, Indian media. I could not find a news about this, uh, uh, this disease. I'll tell you a small story about covering the uh, story and how did it come to me. In 2019, I got a call from a scientist, Mitali Mukherjee. Some of you may have heard of her. Um, uh, she was at the time working at the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in New Delhi. I had met her a couple of months ago uh, before the call uh, to cover something that she was researching about uh, called Ayurgenomics, science uh, as she called it at the intersection of Ayur Ayurveda and genomics. She had received mixed coverage in the media. There was all, uh, already quite a bit of stories about her, but mostly negative. Some uh, uh, journalists and the media outlets had just completely mocked her because it had Ayurveda in it. When I approached Bitali, um, I just wanted to sort of check what kind of questions she had. What I found is that she was just beginning to scratch the surface of uh, uh, this thing that she wanted to research, and some of her questions were genuine, which is what I reported about in my story. Maybe it was in the way I reported the story uh, that she called me that uh, afternoon in, uh, uh, in late 2019. And she said that, Ankur, I want to tell you about something that she and her team had been researching for 20 years. And she said that we have fiercely guarded it from the media attention. They had fiercely guarded what they were working, which was this uh, rare genetic disease from the media attention, 
because it affected some of the most vulnerable communities in India. They were also living with severe stigma uh, because they had the disease. I'll get a little bit technical here, but I'll keep it simple. DNA. Think of DNA as a twisted ladder, just in case you don't come from a background in uh, uh, science. And the rungs of the ladder are uh, made of these uh, letters, which in science we call uh, bases. Again, oversimplifying it here, uh, the way these letters are arranged guides how the proteins are made in our body. And the proteins pretty much do everything from forming muscles to determining a color of your eye, the curl of your hair. I don't, <laughs> I got no curls. That's a different uh, <laughs> matter. Um, so uh, they determine pretty much everything. But sometimes due to mutations, these letters tend, these letters repeat more often than they should. So what happens because of that? That then leads to formation of abnormally long chains of proteins. All of this is super fascinating if you start writing about science journalism. Uh, abnormally long chains of protein that then accumulate in your brain. And they start affecting a specific area of, of your brain called cerebellum, which controls movement. So what happens to uh, the communities uh, uh, who get this disease uh, is that their movements begin to shake. I mean, for example, um, simple movements, everyday movements like walking, talking, holding a cup of tea, hailing a taxi, <coughs> climbing uh, a set of stairs, swallowing food. And over time, these uh, uh, symptoms become more and more severe. And in places like India, where we don't have a lot, we don't have strong health systems, especially around disability, uh, the patients become bedridden, completely dependent on their families if they have family support until they die. There is no cure for uh, uh, the disease. It is so rare that it does not even find a mention in the list of rare diseases that the Indian government has, because all the, the list that the Indian government has only lists disease, rare diseases that have a cure. This one doesn't. And there's something really tragic. I mean, it's a tragic disease, but there's something even more tragic about the disease is that these repeats tend to get longer in successive generations. So if I get the symptoms when I'm 40, and if I have children and they get the repeat from me, they'll get a longer repeat, which means they'll get the symptoms much earlier in their life, say, for example, when they are 25, which is when they have just exited college, started working, and they start getting the symptoms. So a lot of the communities that I was talking to, they felt like, why did I even study? I wanted to do that. I, I wish I had known that, uh, that I'm going to get the disease. I wouldn't study this thing, or I wouldn't become a dancer. Now there is more knowledge in the, uh, in the communities. But what happens is that, because they're living with this uh, uh, movement disorder, uh, and especially these communities, uh, there's so much stigma that women, especially, do not even get out of the houses. Uh, their families don't let them, because if they do, the world outside is going to find out that they have the disease, and they, nobody would marry them. Now that there's knowledge in the community that it exists, because there's, I mean, uh, one thing I forgot to say is that it uh, primarily exists in communities that practice endogamy, have historically practiced endogamy. Uh, but now there is knowledge that it's the endogamy that is causing the disease. They want to marry outside. But if the outside world, outside community, uh, commu uh, people who are outside the community get to know about this uh, uh, disease, they won't marry them. So they're pretty much trapped with this disease. And there is, again, no cure. This is a family I met in Saharanpur, Niyamit Ilahi on the right. She has the disease. Four of her sons have the disease. One of them died when I was uh, reporting about um, the story. This is Ashish in uh, Buldana. Wanted to become a cricketer, but couldn't. His sister behind was uh, uh, working as a teacher in a school. But now uh, she's at home. Priyanka in a village in uh, Buldana. 
Another uh, thing that I noticed while reporting the disease, uh, disease is that um, most of the time it's the mothers who are the caregivers of uh, these uh, uh, children and they're constantly worried that uh, uh, if they die, what will happen to their, the, to their children? Their only hope, there's, there's only single hope they have, is doctors like Mitali and Farooq, uh, who is leading the research in New Delhi, that they will come up with a cure and they will uh, have some sort of a solution. But Farooq has his own problems. He doesn't have funds. These are the, I mean, I want to come back to this picture, is that these handles I found in most of the houses I visited. Before they get to the wheelchair, they use these handles to walk uh, in their house because their movements are uh, 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 challenged. This is something that Farooq said. So, I mean, because it's a neurological disorder, it, uh, um, the field is rich, it has funds, but most of the funds tend to go to diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And funds then determine actually how many scientists get into that field. So if the, if the field is not rich with funds, researchers won't, won't get in because they want to uh, advance in their own career, research something, um, um, write papers and advance the science. But they, if they know that th this is not an area where there are funds, they won't get into it. So again, the field itself doesn't progress. After I reported the story, I mean, um, this is something that Farooq said when I uh, asked him this question, is that it's only natural that everybody wants to play cricket, which is what everybody wants to probably do. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, uh, research or a heart research or a cancer research, how many are throwing a javelin? But it's there the javelin, we need more funds. So Farooq and Mitali are also trapped. Very quickly, uh, some years ago I did this story, again, a neglected tropical disease I reported from Ethiopia. Um, how I got the story? Because I just asked some of the scientists who were working on the story, who were working on neglected tropical diseases, to tell me the most neglected tropical disease. And this scientist told me that go to rural Ethiopia and you'll find a fascinating disease that there is really no press about currently. This was many years ago in 2015. I traveled to rural Ethiopia and what I found was absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, in rural Ethiopia, there's this culture that people walk barefoot and uh, uh, the soil is toxic. So as they walk over and over, uh, uh, as they walk there, the toxins inside the soil uh, get into their feet uh, and they lead to some sort of a chemical reaction because of which their feet enlarge. You might have heard of a disease called elephantiasis in which there are large uh, feet, something, something like that. But the feet become really large and the skin ruptures, uh, infection gets in. It looks really grotesque and um, ugly, but uh, communities are living with it. When they go to the doctors there, uh, the doctors give them medicines, uh, but uh, the medicine is not the cure which is why this disease completely fell through the cracks of uh, uh, the global international health community. Uh, a, uh, a scientist started looking at this disease, a British scientist who was traveling in Ethiopia, and she figured a simple cure, which was shoes. Uh, because the disease is not caused by any uh, pathogen, bacteria, um, a virus, which is that most of the funds, uh, health funds go to, the shoes were the solution. If people wore shoes, they would not get the disease. And those who had gotten the disease and their feet were big, the thing that was needed is that make large shoes. When you make large shoes and clean your feet every day with just soap and water and wear shoes, your feet will come slowly come back to the normal. Such a simple solution to uh, a problem which is affecting millions of people in Africa, especially in uh, rural Ethiopia, but it had completely fell through. The point I'm trying to make here is that ask questions from the margin. Ask questions that a lot of people are not asking. There is a lot of merit in highlighting these uh, stories. If you don't, they, some of them would probably never come out. The scientist who was researching uh, the disease told me that she got a lot of attention after the story came out. 
But there's a point I want to make about covering vulnerable communities. Uh, this is the sh big shoe that uh, people wore there, and their feet then came back to normal. So I was trying to make a point about the vulnerable communities. Be transparent about how and how much they will be represented in the story when you are talking to them. Uh, when I was covering the uh, rare disease story in, uh, in India, I told them, I told all the people that I'm talking to you first time, uh, this is the first interview, I uh, may come back to you later and ask you more questions, but uh, you may not be represented in the story. So you need to know that. And so then you can decide whether you want to be a part of it or not. This is the power dynamics question. Give them the option to refuse the interview. I think most of us don't do it, especially when we are covering vulnerable communities. When people, if you're interviewing somebody who has more power, they may tell you, actually, I don't want to get interviewed. But a lot of vulnerable communities just assume that because you have come to them, they're obliged to answer to you. But tell them that they can't refuse the interview. This will, you will find out this will actually make the interview much better. Over-explain potential harm. What do I mean by this? Again, when you're vulnerab covering vulnerable communities, sometimes they're not educated. Even if they're educated, they're living in areas where they don't have access to big uh, uh, media, uh, media outlets that they watch. So tell them that the story may feature in a big media outlet and uh, it will get a lot of attention which could uh, harm them. Or uh, if they and the people around them don't watch that media outlet, tell them that uh, the story can get translated. It has a way to uh, come into the WhatsApp groups, which may then reach you or people around you. A lot of time I have found that when I explain these different kinds of scenarios, which could cause them harm, they said they don't want to be uh, named. And initially when they started, oh, no, you can name me, there is no problem. But here you really need to protect the vulnerable communities. So over explain harm, give them all the scenarios that you can think of. Keep checking. If you have time, I mean, I do magazine writing, so I have a lot of time as the stories develop. I tell them, I keep checking with them if their life situation has changed. Uh, should I still be naming them? Should I still be writing about them? A lot of times uh, uh, it has happened that when the story is just at the publication stage, people have pulled out. And I have respected uh, that decision. Uh, my editors have respected that decision and changed uh, the story. But keep checking with them. Another question that I have uh, tackled a lot in my career is who gets to do science? It's another margins question. Uh, it's a culture question, it's a social question which some of the presenters before me dealt with. Um, and then uh, who gets to do science and then what kinds of science gets done is connected to that. I did a story for Nature magazine uh, in 2023 uh, looking at the um, diversity data in some of the top uh, scientific institutes uh, in, in India. What I did is that for about a year, I filed lots of RTIs in these top uh, scientific institutes, including TIFR, IITs, IISCs, asking uh, about the data on the Dalit indigenous uh, OBC scientists at different levels, professor, assistant professor, associate professor, PhD. I also looked at the higher education survey data to figure out how many actually are even entering uh, science. And it threw, uh, I'm not the first one <laughs> to write about this story. It has been reported uh, uh, quite a bit. But I looked at the data extensively. Here is what I found. In some of these institutes, less than 1% professors are Dalit or Adivasi. And in some of the top science uh, institutes, like you will see TIFR, not a single Dalit or Adivasi professor in the institute. So who is getting to do science here? The, 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 the gray bars represent the uh, scientists from the privileged uh, community. So this is at the top level, and you'll see that uh, uh, representation as assistant professor is slightly more than it reduces, and the professor level, it's much, much less. Which is also why if you read science stories in media, they're some of the mo least diverse stories in terms of the sources 
you're talking to. Because when you, as journalists, when you go to these institutes and you're asking questions about who is doing what and what is their opinion on something that's going on in the world, you're only hearing mostly from the scientists from the privileged caste. You're not hearing the view of the scientists from the uh, less privileged committee because they are, they are just not there to give you the view. Then I looked at, so what's happening, how many are actually entering uh, the sciences at the undergraduate level? <coughs> it's the undergraduate data that I got from higher education surveys. Uh, at that time, the 2020 data was the most, uh, um, uh, most recently available data. You'll see that the arts graph is much higher when it comes to Dalit and Adivasi uh, students. But do they like arts more? Uh, than science, that was the question I was asking. Again, I was not the first person to ask that question. I spoke to a lot of people who might be thinking about the same problem. I spoke to Sonajariya Mins, one of the scientists. She is a famous computer scientist and Adivasi uh, in uh, uh, JNU. At that time, she was uh, the vice chancellor of Sido Kano Murmu University in Dumka, Jharkhand, I mean, surrounded by a lot of uh, indigenous communities. She had been asking the same question and she had collected data for a couple of years when she became the uh, vice chancellor and she saw a pattern, the same one that is reflected in the higher education survey, is that most of the students who were applying for the undergrad uh, courses were taking arts and humanities. They were not taking science. Not because arts courses were uh, more popular, like I said, it's not that they liked arts more. What she found in her research was that the teachers and mentors are specializing in science in schools were just not there in the areas the students were coming from. Or uh, some of the teachers who were there in uh, bigger towns would not travel to the smaller towns to teach science. So what the students studied was mostly arts and humanities. Again, the click. Or the science schools were too far and the students uh, needed to help their parents do the agriculture work or other things so they could not travel too far to study science. Lack of role models within their families, they did not have scientists in their families or people who studied science or could tell them that there is this fascinating world out there you should study. Fewer people to guide in their network uh, or the uh, science courses had higher fee. Because as you would know, there are practical exams. Uh, they just make the uh, curriculum more expensive and they just could not afford uh, the higher fee. And these were some of the reasons which is why fewer students were entering uh, the undergraduate courses. Another thing I found is that if people got into undergrad level, did the masters, there was a sharp decline at the PhD level. This is again the data from top IITs, mid IITs, IISCs, and, uh, and BHU. 10% uh, representation from Dalits, just 2% representation from Adivasis at the PhD level. When I spoke to these uh, uh, Dalit and Adivasi PhD researchers and uh, Dalit and Adivasi um, uh, professors who were working there, uh, a pattern kind of emerged, which then I corroborated with the institutes across, uh, uh, in the institutes that I was collecting this data from, is that when they enter the institute, Almost all of them said a version of, there is nobody like me around me. So when they were uh, going to be taken by these supervisors, the supervisors, some of them would just refuse. And if there was institutional pressure on the supervisors to take the Dalit and Adivasi uh, or Adivasi student, they would just not pay enough attention. And because of which, a lot of times, students just drop out. So then I asked uh, off the record, of course, some of these uh, uh, scientists from the privileged communities that why they are, I mean, why is it that you're not working with Dalit and Adivasi science students? And they said that, look, Ankur, it's not that I don't want to. I'm working in a system that privileges uh, publishing papers. And to publish papers, I need a student who already probably comes with an good understanding of knowledge of science, can support me, we can do it faster, and that's how my career progresses. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a bit of a generalized statement, but this is what they said, is that the Lithan Adivasi student tends to take more uh, uh, effort from uh, my side, 
uh, as, as a uh, professor, I need to give them more time and resources. I just don't have time. And the system I work in or the university I, I work in, it's not that they are giving me a promotion to work with underprivileged students. So the system is such that it's not incentivizing me to work with the students. So it's a problem both ways. Now, um, I mean, fortunately, this story and a lot of other stories like this that came out at that time created a lot of pressure on the uh, 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 Science and Technology Institutes in, in India to then create systems to bring in more uh, um, uh, researchers from the Dalit and Azivasi communities, uh, like training them, uh, creating uh, um, special quota to bring them in. Uh, and uh, a small point about the affirmative action or uh, reservation is here, that it brings you into the system, uh, which is really important. But if the system doesn't support you, you drop out. So then uh, there's a second layer of protection that needs to come in here, which the inst institutes need to provide. This is another data point that I found. Uh, I filed lots of RTIs to the science and technology uh, branches of the uh, government uh, that provide funding. You will see that most of the funding, over 80%, has gone to scientists from the uh, privileged caste. 0.7% Adivasis, 6% Dalit, and uh, this technology transfer division is a five-year data. Again, you see who is getting to do science. <coughs> People, I mean, it's not that, uh, I mean, Dalit and Adivasi students have fascinating questions, things that they want to uh, progress in their science, but who is getting the support? That's a question uh, that uh, we should be asking, and whether there's, there's a system that's supporting that or not. Uh, when I began my talk, I said that I'll be talking about unequal scientific uh, collaborations. These collaborations are increasing across the world, tackling some of the biggest problems like uh, AIDS, uh, COVID-19, climate change, heat, agriculture, pest, all these things. But if you look at the makeup of these scientific collaborations, there's a peculiar makeup. Uh, the makeup is that if the university is in the global north, US or UK, and uh, in the global south, India, Sri Lanka, parts of Africa, the scientists in uh, uh, developing or least developed countries would be given the role of data collection or talking to the uh, communities. So they will collect the data, talk to the communities, send the data over to scientists in the global north who will analyze the data, make sense of the data, write uh, the paper, there's massive uh, uh, inequalities on how the uh, division is, is done in terms of who is doing what. Another important part that came out in some of the research that I have done is who has got the money. The funding institutions historically have given, and now this is changing because of more journalism on this now, the funding institution has historically given money to institutes in the Global North, because there is this biased understanding in the minds of funders that they have the systems, that these institutes have the systems to figure out how the research should be run, uh, or they are able to manage the money more, uh, better, or more efficiently, and those systems are not present in least developed countries. But whoever, remember this always, whoever has money decides what gets done. So the scientists in the Global North then decide what is the research priority on the pest in Africa that's destroying the crops of people there, what should be the study first? What kind of question we should ask first? Uh, uh, what kind of data collection should be done first? And then that leads to all ki kind of inequalities in the system. Then the products that come out, a lot of them fail because of this reason, because the way it is designed, it's unequal. So the, the products actually don't work for the communities and they fail. It should be the other way around. Now the funders are realizing because of this pressure and the uh, systems are being created to give money to the, uh, where the, uh, to the institute where the problem is. This is a recent paper that has just come up talking about the same problem which, which uh, continues. Quickly, who gets to participate in science? AIDS research is some, one of the longest running research, but even now, these are recent figures, 
women and girls make up only 20% of the participants. This is global data, even though they make up the majority of the people with HIV. Older people, only 7% of the trials. These are all views from the margins. When you're, when you're standing uh, um, uh, alongside uh, communities on the margins, you will be asking these questions. So think about where are you standing, on whose behalf you're asking the questions. Continuing with my desire to uh, make the underrepresented communities feel seen, about a year and a half ago, I started Queer Beat to cover underrepresented LGBTQ communities in the media, which are also the most uh, misreported in the uh, Indian media ecosystem. We, because I'm a science journalist, so we also do a lot of science stories in the media um, outlet. Here on the left hand side, you, it's a recent story that I did on the non-binary community, how that interacts with the health system there, which is very, very binary. So uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, all the surgeons in these uh, uh, big top institutes, we spoke to some of the really top uh, uh, institutes in, uh, uh, in India who do the uh, gender transition surgery. The understanding is mostly male to female and female to male transition. They have no understanding of non-binary communities. There's a lot of dismissal of the non-binary identity. What's happening here is that when non-binary people are going to these doctors, they have a very different desire of transition. It's not your usual male to female or female to male transition. They may be dys dysphoric about one particular part of their body. For example, they may just be dysphoric about their breasts. They want rest of the body to remain the same but just don't want the breasts. Some, because they don't fit into the male and female binary, they want a chest where there are no nipples. Now this may seem bizarre to a lot of scient uh, scientists and surgeons who are in the Indian medical system, but this is not new. There's already a lot of research in the Western world. There's a lot of work that the LGBTQIA communities have done with the medical systems across the world to change curriculums, to change systems. Now there are guidelines in places that how do you work with non-binary communities to give them the care they want. It was fascinating to see some of the non-binary people in India who worked with doctors here, and we interviewed a doctor in Assam who acknowledged with a lot of humility that he didn't know this. And he said that, you tell me what do you want done and how can we do this together that affirms your identity. And what we see is that the communities are helping the doctors. They are finding the research papers, sending it to the doctor. They are finding the examples that this was a case from Japan or the US where this kind of transition was done. Look at this, how this was done. Maybe you can speak to the doctor there. So these kind of inter interactions are happening. This story appeared nowhere else but in Queer Beat because we understand the community. We are asking these questions from, from the margins. I'm ending it here. But what do the, these stories told from the margins do? They question system of power in science and hold them accountable. They question who gets to produce and share knowledge with the resources that they need. People have questions and they uh, have knowledge, but they also need resources. They make, the, as I've been saying, they make the underrepresented, whether a topic or communities, feel seen. And I can't stress this uh, more. There is so much power in feeling seen. It just doesn't help the community. It helps people around the communities. They push a discourse to make science inclusive. So your science journalism is actually making science inclusive. Like I gave you that example of the pressure that uh, uh, a lot of journalists and media outlets put to ask the institutions to create systems to bring in more scientists from the Dalit and Adivasi community. So you are actually helping make science inclusive when you put these pressures. An inclusive science is just science. Thank you so much.
thank you sir um i wanted to ask so um what are the roles of uh, both people in the center and people in the uh, peripheries in uh, creating this um uh in uh, creating sciences like and something out of experiences of all people like not just uh science done by cisgendered heterosexual uh, mostly male people because for example the conception of uh gender not as a binary but as a spectrum so um that in 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 the field of science as a whole that is relatively recent because uh, uh people who weren't so gendered were not allowed to speak up for a long time so what what are the roles that uh yeah which are required of uh, for what are the actions required from people both in the center and the social peripheries to achieve this type of science I mean one of the things that they just have to do is is collaborate more talk to each other more I think the talk itself is is not happening I also uh, want to say is that uh, people who have power need to realize that their power that they have it and need to leave their chair need to leave the seat and create the space for others to come in which is also not happening and uh, also there's a lot of hesitation in the marginalized communities to ask questions uh because then they fear that there would be consequences so the system need to be created that it's safe for them to raise their voice it's safe for them to ask uh, questions and there would be no consequences only then we are looking at a system where everybody is asking questions a science is getting done that helps everyone can you show the name of the research again the name Sorry? of the research you had mentioned there was a recent research about um collaborative experiences globally Can you show the name of the research again? Uh the the global collaboration yeah. I was uh, talking about I can just give you my slide and you can have it yeah yeah I mean if you just google there are lots of papers it's it's um, I mean it's a very hot area right now studying inequality Uh so you were talking about uh just call me ankur yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to sir Yeah, Ankur. So you were basically talking about stories about the marginal people, and I get it. A very important part of it is to reach the policymakers and stuff. But a lot of what uh, people's journalism also, but more so specifically science journalism on the margins is dealing with, let's say, a CNN or a Courier Beat, or even uh, English press, English newspapers, whatever. They are not reachable to the people who are actually affected by those issues. So. there needs to be a transfer of power transfer of knowledge to those people and in a medium format package which is consumable by them so how do you do this great question uh this is something that in queer beat we talk a lot about and and uh, to some extent at cnn what we're trying to do is just do more collaboration so if we have done a story in english we try to uh, talk to local outlets like we have worked a lot with khabar lehria that works in up translating the uh, story so they they reach the communities where these conversation need to happen more uh, because we have been doing this stories i'm just uh, uh, very fortunate to say that a lot of translators have uh, come together saying that you know these stories are important we want to translate these stories in hindi and so that they reach more people so when you start doing this work the support also come your way and i've been very fortunate uh, ankur i have question Uh, you mentioned that uh, in in the in the earlier slides that uh, it's important to reach out to people as expert voices of expertise who are not uh, the canonical people that you reach out to and so on but then how do you find out because many there's a lot of reluctance especially if you take caste there's a lot of reluctance on the part of the scientists to own up to their caste and say that i am from this community and very highly politicized people do it but not so much scientists and uh, how do you transcend this problem great question again and something i have struggled with a lot what i do is that is i send mass emails <laughs> i send lots of emails if if i'm covering mathematics department or physics department i send the email to everyone saying that look i'm working on this story these are the people i want to talk to if you are one or know someone who may talk to me just connect me and that way i've got some help but it's it it is hard because the systems are not safe for people to come out but i just reach out to lots of people thank you yeah one last question 
I'm my young. Uh, I wanted your views on uh, the rise of s sensationalism and specifically in science journalism because uh, this is a broader topic but uh, we had seen it in the tech industry with Boeing and now emerging into the health and medicine aspect of science journalism. So uh, what do you think of the, uh, the reporters and uh, journalists moving into certain innovation reporting rather than into the whistleblowing business of science journalism? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. You're asking that the rise of sensationalism mm -hmm. in science in journalism science because journalists are rather than going for the the reporting on innovation, they're going into the whistleblowing business. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't have a fully formed uh, answer to this question, I'm sorry. But I would just say that work with your uh, um, editor, the newsroom, to create systems where this kind of journalism is discouraged and you're asking the right questions there. Uh, checks that are uh, put in place so that these kind of stories, you, you're basically checking that whether it's, a, it, whether it's a sensationalist story or it's an accurate representation of what's happening in the world. It's, to me, it's more of a checks and balances questions if, if you're working in the system. So thank you very much, Ang Angkor. Uh, I mean, really, really <laughs> very, very sensitive.